Ladies and gentlemen, we're pleased to have in South Carolina our keynote speaker, Senator Ted Cruz. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Chad. You know, Chad, I, I asked you not to mention that I went to Harvard. You know, South Carolina is kind of like West Texas. And any time in West Texas they found out I went to Harvard, I immediately got to say, I got a lot to apologize for. You know, Texas and South Carolina have a long, long connection, a connection that goes back centuries. As Lindsay mentioned, there were two native South Carolinians, William Barrett Travis and James Bonham in the Alamo. William Barrett Travis was the commander of the Alamo as Texas fought for its freedoms, and James Bonham was sent out to get reinforcements and he fought his way back in through the attacking army to come back to the Alamo where he gave his life for freedom. That's the tradition, that is the history of South Carolina and Texas, and it's a tremendous link. So thank you for the support South Carolina has given then and now as we fight side by side for freedom. So Vice President Joe Biden's in town. You know, the great thing is you don't even need a punchline. You just say that and people laugh. But, you know, the Vice President has some great advice for all of us on the guns issue. He told everyone, if anybody is attacking your home, it's attacking your family, just go outside with a double-barreled shotgun and fire both barrels in the air. Now, now, that's great advice if it so happens you're being attacked by a flock of geese. <laughs> and I would note the last person to follow that advice was Vice President Dick Cheney. <laughs> when he had that tragic hunting accident in Texas where a terrific lawyer from Austin named Harry Whittington was shot. Now, I'll tell you something I bet you most of you don't know. In the two weeks after Vice President Cheney's hunting accident, there were more than 200 phone calls to Texas Parks and Wildlife asking how much for a license to shoot a Republican lawyer. <laughs> also today, President Obama's down in Mexico. In Mexico, he said that Mexican gun violence is due to U.S. guns. Well, you know, I would suggest a place he could have started was not to have his Department of Justice selling guns to Mexican drug cartels. What I'd like to talk to you about today is the American spirit, something that links every one of us together. And I want to talk to you about four principles of the American spirit. Courage, freedom, growth, and opportunity. I want to start with courage. And I'll tell you, I do not know anyone who embodies courage more than Senator Jim DeMint. Jim DeMint has many, many characteristics, but being utterly fearless is perhaps his most unusual one. In fact, I would note that in that regard, he reminds me of a Texan, Chuck Norris. <laughs> now, you know, some people wear Superman pajamas. Well, Superman wears Chuck Norris pajamas. <laughs> and Chuck Norris wears Jim DeMint pajamas. But Jim DeMint also reminds me of another South Carolinian, the Swamp Fox, <laughs> whose fierce perseverance 
helped America become a nation and helped us defeat the mightiest army, the mightiest military the world had ever seen in the American Revolution. You know, when Jim DeMint was in the Senate, he found himself over and over again a voice in the wilderness. And he did something starting in 2009 that was really quite extraordinary. He said, the Senate's not going to change unless we change the people who are in the Senate. And he began getting involved in Republican primaries. Now, it's worth underscoring how incredibly unusual that was. That was not done. And yet he began going all around the country saying, I want to find strong, principled leaders who are willing to stand and fight. Because he was concerned, as every man and woman is here today, that our freedom is in jeopardy in this country. And he got behind candidates like Mike Lee, like Rand Paul, like Marco Rubio, like Ron Johnson, like Pat Toomey. Every one of those races, the Greybeards had decided someone else should win. And yet, Jim DeMint stuck his neck on the line and said, we need strong conservative leaders. And every one of them won with the support of the conservative grassroots. In 2012, three new Republicans got elected. Jeff Flake. Deb Fisher and myself, and Jim DeMint's support was critical to all three of us who won. Let me tell you right now, I would not be in the United States Senate were it not for Senator Jim DeMint. And that legacy has already transformed the U.S. Senate. Pick any issue, pick any fight. And who are the people that are charging out into battle and leading the fight? They are the Rand Pauls, the Mike Lees, the Marco Rubios, the leaders who are there because of Jim DeMint's support. That's courage, and that's how you turn the country around. A second principle is freedom. You know, freedom is really, I think, the foundational value of our country. And the tool we crafted, our framers crafted, that was quite revolutionary to preserve freedom was the Constitution. Thomas Jefferson described the Constitution as chains to bind the mischief of government. And right now we're seeing our freedom under assault every day because our constitutional liberties are threatened. In my view, we should stand for the Constitution and every part of the Constitution. We should stand for the First Amendment, and yet all of us are shocked and horrified to read newspaper headlines this weekend that this administration is threatening to court-martial members of the military if they share their faith to others. You know, there comes a point where you just can't make this stuff up. The First Amendment protects our free exercise of religion, and let me be very, very clear, the United States government has no authority to tell any American in the military or not that he or she cannot share his faith with someone else. The Second Amendment, many of us have seen that President Obama has been pushing an agenda aggressively to come after our constitutional right to keep and bear arms. I'll tell you, several weeks ago, I was proud to stand with my friend Senator Rand Paul and Senator Mike Lee in sending a very, very short letter to Harry Reid that said, we will filibuster any legislation that undermines the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. And what we saw happen in the next few weeks was incredible. The American people got engaged. The men and women in this room began speaking up, began calling Washington, began going online, going on Facebook, going on Twitter, and saying, 
Go after the violent criminals. Come down on them like a ton of bricks. But protect the constitutional rights of law-abiding Americans. And let me tell you something, during the fight to protect our Second Amendment, there was no one who worked harder and who I was more honored to be side by side with than your senior Senator Lindsey Graham. And as a result of the leadership of Lindsey Graham and Tim Scott and countless others, and as a result of each of you speaking out and the American people being heard, two weeks ago, when President Obama's gun control agenda got voted on, every single proposal that would undermine our right to keep and bear arms was voted down in the United States Senate. We should be defending the Fourth and Fifth Amendments against an administration that recognizes no limits on its powers. I was also proud to stand side by side with Rand Paul in a 13-hour filibuster against this administration's drone policy. That day began with Attorney General Eric Holder testifying in front of the Judiciary Committee. And I took the opportunity to ask the Attorney General a few gentle questions. In particular, I asked him, Mr. Attorney General, in your opinion, does the Constitution allow the United States government to use a drone to kill a U.S. citizen on U.S. soil if that individual doesn't pose an imminent threat? The Attorney General's response was, well, that wouldn't be appropriate. I got to tell you, my response was, General Holder, it seems you have misunderstood my question. I wasn't asking about propriety. You are the chief legal officer for the United States of America. Does the Department of Justice have a position on whether the Constitution allows the U.S. government to use a drone to kill a U.S. citizen in those circumstances? Yet again, he said, it wouldn't be appropriate. Three times we went back and forth. I, I, I really thought any minute he was going to say to me, I, I do not understand that this Constitution to which you're referring. <laughs> but during the 13-hour filibuster that day, as one senator after another after another came to the floor of the Senate, as 20 House members came to the floor of the Senate, again, just as with guns, thousands upon thousands of men and women all across this country got involved, spoke up, got online, got on Twitter, stood for liberty. And as a result, the next day, the Obama administration was forced to do what it had refused to do for three straight weeks, which is admit in writing, no, the Constitution doesn't let it kill a U.S. citizen on U.S. soil with a drone. We should be defending the Tenth Amendment. And one of the most critical elements of doing that is we should repeal every single word of Obamacare. And let me take the, the opportunity to salute your governor, Nikki Haley, for having the courage to say no to expanding Medicaid and Obamacare. <laughs> South Carolina has a tradition, a long, long tradition of producing fighters, and Nikki Haley is a rock star who is inspiring the country. Thank you, governor. <laughs> you know, with Obamacare, as it gets implemented, it's getting less and less popular because more and more people are realizing it simply isn't working. A couple of weeks ago, the senior Democrat who was the principal architect of Obamacare said Obamacare was becoming a, quote, train wreck. Well, I agree with that Democratic senator. You know, I'm reminded of one of my heroes, a former senator from the state of Texas, Phil Graham. And Senator Graham was participating in a hearing on socialized medicine. And the panel was explaining 
was talking about socialized medicine, and Senator Graham said, well, you know, I feel confident that I care about my kids more than anybody else does. And one of the witnesses on the panel said, with all due respect, Senator, I care about your kids just as much as you do. Senator Graham looked at him and said, really? What are their names? <laughs> there is almost no limit to what this president and this administration thinks the federal government can do. We've got to get back to the U.S. Constitution. We've got to get back to limits on federal government powers. We've got to get back to our freedom. That's how we turn the country around. Third principle of the American spirit is growth. I think the very top priority of every elected official is restoring economic growth. You know, in the last four years, our economy has grown 0.9%. 0.9%. There's only one other period since World War II of four consecutive years of less than 1% growth. That was 1979 to 1982. Coming, coming out of the Jimmy Carter administration, same failed economic policies, out of control spending, out of control debt, out of control taxes, out of control regulation. And it led to the exact same stagnation. Look, growth is fundamental to solving every other problem. If we want to get the 23 million people who are struggling to find jobs back to work, we need growth. If we want to turn around our unsustainable deficits and debt, we got to have growth. If we want to ensure that we maintain the strongest military in the world to defend our national security, we must have growth. And I think growth should be a bipartisan objective. There is no reason why Republicans and Democrats can't be working side by side to get our economy going again, to build the Keystone Pipeline, to stop regulations, to push for tax reform, to get small businesses moving. You know, a couple of days ago, Jay Leno observed, so the president is having a hard time shutting down Guantanamo. Well, I've got an idea. He could just declare it's a small business, do what he always does, and tax it out of existence. <laughs> It'd be gone in days, weeks, gone. We need growth. And the fourth and final thing that we need is opportunity. Growth is fundamental for so many reasons, but the most important is that growth produces opportunity. For a long time, I've been arguing for what I call opportunity conservatism, which is that every principle, every policy we think about, we talk about, should focus like a laser on opportunity, on easing the means of ascent up the economic ladder. The greatest engine of prosperity and opportunity and wealth creation the world has ever seen is the free market system in the United States of America. And let me tell you something, there is no member of the U.S. Senate who understands that better than Senator Tim Scott. I love Senator Tim Scott. And let me tell you one of the reasons, because he understands in his gut that if you're struggling to climb the economic ladder, the only thing that has ever worked is a free market system that allows small businesses to prosper, allows people to stand on their own feet, that doesn't create dependency but encourages people to work and stand on their own feet and strive towards the American dream. You know, I love listening to Senator Scott talk about how he was in high school. And as he described, he said he was close to flunking out of high school. He had failed, as he put it, both English and Spanish. And Senator Scott observes, when you fail English and Spanish, they don't say you're bilingual. <laughs> they say you're bi-ignorant. And he tells a powerful story of meeting a man who he describes as his mentor. 
who owned a couple of Chick-fil-A franchises and who brought him under his wing and he, and he said, Tim, the path you're on is not going to take you to where you want to be. That's not how you get to the American dream. If you want to get to prosperity, you have to rely on hard work. You have to rely on discipline. You have to apply yourself at school. You have to go and create a small business. You have to go and create jobs. You have to take advantage of the incredible opportunity in this country. That is Tim Scott's life. That is the opportunity we as Republicans should champion every single day. You know, the unemployment we see in this economy doesn't fall uniformly over the population. It falls most severely on the most vulnerable among us. If you got a college degree, unemployment right now is 3.8 percent. It's a pretty robust labor market for high-skilled college graduates. If you don't have a high school degree, unemployment is over 12 percent. Hispanics, it's nearly 10 percent. African Americans, 14 percent. Young people age 16 to 19, it's over 25 percent. You know, one-third of young people age 25 to 29 are moving back in with their parents. One third. The Obama economy, the people who are being hit the worst are young people, are single moms, are African Americans, are Hispanics, are those struggling to climb the economic ladder. And as Republicans, we need to be challenging every day. The way you achieve prosperity is you have economic growth that allows, there has been no nation on earth that has allowed so many millions of people to come with nothing and achieve anything. You know, I have to say, when I talk of opportunity, in my life, as in all of your lives, it's not some abstract concept you read about in a book. It's a reality we've all lived. My dad is from Cuba. He was born in Cuba. He grew up in Cuba. As a kid, my father fought in the Cuban Revolution. When he was a teenager, he was thrown in prison and tortured. He was beaten almost to death. He fled Cuba in 1957. He was 18 years old. He came to Texas. When he arrived, he couldn't speak English. He had nothing except for $100 sewn into his underwear and a slide rule in his pocket. You know, Chad, when I talk to young people, they have no idea what a slide rule is. And he got a job washing dishes, making 50 cents an hour. And he worked seven days a week. He paid his way through the University of Texas. And he went on to start a small business, working towards the American dream. When I was a kid, my father used to say to me over and over again, when we lost our freedom in Cuba, I had a place to flee to. If we lose our freedom here, where do we go? You know, that fundamentally is why every one of us is here tonight. My dad's been my hero my whole life, but what I find most incredible about his story is how commonplace it is. Every one of us could come up here one after the other and tell a story just like that. We are all the children of those who risked everything for freedom. I think that's the most fundamental DNA of what it means to be an American. And that's why we're here tonight fighting to take our country back. I want to make two final points in conclusion. The first is change happens quickly. A lot of Republicans are demoralized about November 2012. I want to remind you of 2005. In 2005, George W. Bush had just been reelected president. Republicans had control of both the House and the Senate and a large majority of the governorships. And Democrats were going on television, Democrat consultants publicly talking about a, quote, permanent Republican majority. That was 2005. 2006, we lost Congress. 2008, Barack Obama got elected. 2009, Obamacare passes. And here we are today. 
things can change quickly. And because of the legacy of Jim DeMint, because of the leaders in the Senate and in the House who are fighting, I believe change will come quickly. In particular, I am convinced with your help, we're going to take back the U.S. Senate in 2014. How many of you have cell phones on you? I'm going to ask you to take your cell phones off, out, and text the word growth to 33733. Growth to 33733. And help join us to take the Senate back in 2014. Stand together because we're going to take the Senate back in 2014 and we're going to stand in the Senate and fight together to defend our liberty. The last thing I want to say is an observation. Ronald Reagan famously said, freedom is not passed down in the bloodstream. Instead, every generation has to stand and fight for it to preserve it. And that's what we're called on to do tonight. So I want to share with you the words that were written by a native Carolinian, South Carolinian, William Barrett Travis. His last letter from the Alamo, which read as follows. Fellow citizens and compatriots, I am besieged by a thousand or more. I have sustained a continual bombardment and cannonade for 24 hours and have not lost a man. The enemy has demanded a surrender at discretion. Otherwise, the garrison are to be put to the sword. I have answered the demand with a cannon shot. And our flag still waves proudly from the walls. I shall never surrender or retreat. Then I call on you in the name of liberty, of patriotism and of everything dear to the American character to come to our aid with all dispatch. If this call is neglected, I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due to his own honor and that of his country. Victory or death. William Barrett Travis a native South Carolinian, a Texas hero, and like each and every man and woman here, someone who stood up and put it all on the line, fighting for liberty, fighting for this country we love so very much. Thank you, and God bless you. <laughs>